to go ahead and ask you the question on All right, go ahead. I started off just gambling. I call it gambling because I've lost so much. I'm down about two million right now. Two mil. And just options. At this point, I honestly don't think that I will ever give it up until I at least make it back. So you, I think I'm on a down spiral. So. Yeah, no, I mean, you should uh, see a psychiatrist, psychologist. I mean, that's a, it's... There are people that have these problems. There was one guy who recently um, was arrested and basically had a, a problem like this. And it's not, you know, it's not your fault, but you need help and you need to recognize that you need help. And the guy's name, um, you can look it up. It's a very interesting situation. He worked at a Park Hill. That's right. Park Hill. Very professional guy. A lot of family money. Um, let's see here. Andrew Casperson. And uh, yeah, he... He did something very bad. He took some money, gambled it, he lost it, and he covered his tracks and kept doing it and basically ruined his whole life, his family's life, everybody's. It's not good. You know, uh, trading can, can bring out the dopamine in your brain to, you want to gamble, you want to trade, you think it's, you know, it's giving you a rush. It's stupid. At this point, it seems like if I even break even on the trade, I consider it a win. Yeah, that's not good. Not healthy behavior. And, it's going to lead to more financial destruction. I mean, if you have any assets left, you can take those and multiply them by doing something you're good at. Um, and it doesn't take much money. You know, it's interesting. I did a deal with a Texas drug company where I paid them $3 million. And that deal made at least $500 million. So, you know, you can find deals like that and make a big comeback, but it's not going to be by doing the thing that's been losing you money. It's actually affected my business to the point where I've had to take out huge, huge loans with a seventy-five percent of my interest towards those loans from family, actually. But at this point, it's one hundred fifty thousand dollars a month in interest. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear it. Like I said, I think the the best thing you do is stop. You know, it's very alluring that. Uh, you can turn a little bit of money into a lot of money with an option, and the first time you do it, you get, you know, your brain remembers that memory. But uh, it is gambling. Uh, it is gambling. It's weird because I find myself forgetting about it every three months until earnings season starts, and then I'll jump right back into it. Yeah, and it's earnings, the binary event, it's gambling. Uh, I trade a lot of binary events in biotech. I mean, thank God I, I've gotten most of them right. But, um, you know, it's it's a it's a sickness, and you have to you know avoid it. And uh, you should seek some help. And you can always call me some other time. I got to take some other callers, but feel free to call me anytime you want and discuss it. I'm sorry uh, to change the subject, but what is your view on day trading, uh, Martin? Well, uh, there's some people who are very good at it, like Steve Cohen and others. Uh, in general, I'm I'm not. Um, you know. What people sort of fail to understand about investing is that you want your investments to work for you as soon as possible. Yeah. So if you can reliably um, find alpha in very short periods of time, it's an extremely, extremely lucrative thing. It's just very hard to do. Um, in short periods of time, stock movements are typically pretty random. Um, yeah. In fact, the odds are somewhat against someone because there's computers that have better power than a human yeah. and uh, in short periods of time because like, they analyze order flow and volume and stuff like that and a human can't do that and with thousands and thousands and thousands of stocks all at once a computer has no such limitation so it's would you say it's a good way to start learning no no I think uh, the best way to start learning investing is just to make investments uh in general, you know, one shouldn't uh, do it if they're not fully committed and they have 100% dedicated to the task at hand, which very few people can because they have other things to do. So if you want to be a professional investor, that's one thing. If you want to be an amateur investor, I'd say that's like being an amateur competitive poker player. You're just going to lose all your money. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a money business. You can't, you can sort of, I guess you, you can do it for fun if you think it's fun, but in general, you're, you're playing against a very stacked deck against you. It's, it's funny. People love multiplayer anything, uh, especially MOBA, you know, MMO, anything. Just if you, if you look at the games that have taken over the industry, like World of Warcraft, for instance, games like that have existed for literally since the start of computing. But the idea that you could do it with thousands of people was what was 
attractive. And I mean, even De- Dungeons and Dragons was the first MMORPG, right? So uh, basically, yeah. And, and you know, if you take anything and just take it, make it MMO, it I seems mean, to look work. At, look at Agario oh. and Slither. Those are really simple games that are just being amazing no, because yeah. you're playing with so many people. Well, yeah, and, and I I know finance, and I I estimate both. Well, I'd estimate those. If you sold Slither today, you probably could get a hundred million for it. I think games like those are actually the like. Don't you, you think have that's game value though? How much do they make off it? They that's <laughs> not how value works. Um, I figured it's really you know what can you make off of it. So that's why ninety percent of these internet companies don't. It's always free until eventually they figure out their business model, whether it's ads or freemium or whatever. And I'm sure Slithario, if Activision bought Slither, Slither um, or Agar, AR, um, you know, they would quickly, you know, improve it and monetize it. Um, it's the user base that matters. Can you get, can, the biggest question on the internet is, can you get millions of people coming to you every day? That's the only I thing. Have, I guess that's how, like, uh, that's the only least, thing you're trying to solve for. It's like a huge amount of, like, Valve titles or, uh, like Dota 2 and uh, TF2 are all free, except you buy hats. But like, I guess a huge <laughs> amount of it is like an advertisement it's, it's for Steam. It's best to they just completely... get money. More people to get on Steam, more they'll pay for a game on Steam, probably. The biggest, and then Steam yeah. takes a the, cut of that. The biggest thing people mistake, uh, don't understand about the internet is that the business models don't matter. And the last thing you should worry about is the business model. Users matter. Once you have users, you can make money. Um, you know, whether you're implicitly charging them through advertising or explicitly charging them through whatever, as long as you have millions of people loving your, you don't need anything else. I really think these audio games are the future of the industry. Just because you have like games like League that are free and the people will play basically forever and they don't need to buy another game. So the only thing that can compete is another free game. And if you invest less money in in like this AAA free game and it flops, you just lose a ton of stuff, so. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Small IO games are just. By the way, League, League was in AAA, right? So it was, you know, very yeah. inexpensive to make. And, you know, the only problem with League is it's, um, you know, it's executable, um, which isn't necessarily a problem. It's just complex. Uh, yeah. Whereas the, the web apps are inordinately easier. Yeah, you could just type in a address and you're there. I mean, my, my biggest gripe with League is the game time. And I understand that's why people like it, but I can't commit to like an hour sure. for a game. I was wondering if you ever read The Intelligent Investor. Come on. It's like... It's... Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. So, uh, a lot of people say that it's, you know, like the holy Bible and this thing or whatever, but, you know, I was wondering if you had any, you know, criticisms of it. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's a book. You know, it's written by a guy who never made any money investing. I, I, I mean, there's a hundred criticisms of it. I think the point of books isn't that they dictate to you what to do. It's the point of these books is to open your mind to ideas and you're supposed to think through yourself kind of the pros and cons. Obviously the very mechanical way of value investing uh, doesn't work in practice. Um, You know, one of the things a lot of people try to do, for instance, is if a company has say $2 a share of cash on its balance sheet and it's trading for a dollar, a lot of people will try to buy that stock and then shut down the company and get the cash back. But the reality okay. is that the amount of time and cost it takes to do that, you'll burn that whole dollar, sometimes even more. Um, okay. And there's so, I don't know, you know, I think that it's just it's just something that should expand your mind, but it's not like a prescription for success or anything like that. I'm trying to like start building my skills. So I'm taking some financial engineering and risk management courses. I was wondering why you think people learn it wrong? Or like how to... Yeah, I gotta learn like Plato and stuff, you know? To learn how to form inference and got to be able to teach yourself stuff and that's not easy unless you have the tools of logic so it's just like coming to your own conclusions not necessarily like the content coming to any conclusion of anything i mean really socratic logic and mathematical logic being a skeptic probably the most important skill skepticism sober skepticism you can just be a conspiracy theorist if you'd like and you talked a lot about sort of your experience with antidepressants before mm-hmm. And you seem to have had a pretty incredible life story, so I'm curious to hear what has been the lowest point that you've ever felt in your life. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> How much time do you have? 
yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of people have felt low. I've never felt uh, idle or anything like that. Um, I'm too much of an optimist uh, for something like that. But yeah, I think I think there are you know times when people feel, including me, feel really low. I've never felt hopeless, you know, um, because I've had some faith in my sort of uh, intellect. Um, you know, there have been times where, you know, uh, you know, I certainly felt like a, an idiot or like I wasted a lot of time on something or what have you. So, we, we, you know, that all happens sometimes. I think IQ or SAT is a good measure of intelligence. Yeah, pretty much. Intelligence is, uh, you know, some of the smartest people I know are also really depressed and they're not very um, efficient. So they actually have less output than less intelligent, quote unquote, intelligent people. So, you know. Success is about so many different things, not just raw intellect, which is a very, you know, small part of piece of the pie. <clears throat> Although this guy knows a lot about that. Look at this brainiac. Even his hair. Even his hair is, is screams intelligence. Forget the equations on the board there. My favorite equation he's got up there this is the green one, burgers. I think that's one must study that one carefully. <laughs> uh, well, I worked in hedge funds, um, so I th nobody starts a hedge fund just says, oh, I'm going to start a hedge fund. You know, you have to have experience in the field. The same way, um, um, I mean, practically the only space where you can go from zero to hero is tech. Um, uh, in healthcare, like drugs, you need like 50 or 100 million before you can even make a dent. Uh, one mouse experiment can cost you $2 million. So, um, you know, you can write a whole beautiful system for $2 million, you know, uh, or less. You don't need, you know, $50 million to, to start a tech company. So, um, so in hedge funds, it's a little bit similar. You kind of need a lot of critical mass, and you can need to do that slowly and just get a reputation, get a track record, or you can work at big funds and then start a hedge fund. I worked at two big hedge funds. Uh, hedge fund industry was small when I started. Uh, so the hedge fund I worked at, which was Jim Cramer's hedge fund, was by today's standards, it would be very small. But by those standards, it was average or slightly large. Then I worked for a $2 billion hedge fund, which again, by today's standards, is more medium-sized. But by those standards, was pretty big. And um, so when I started a hedge fund, um, it mattered that I worked for a Tiger Cub. It mattered that I worked for um, Kramer. I knew people. I'd been in hedge funds at that point six years, so um, which was still not substantial. And my first hedge fund did not succeed. So uh, my second hedge fund did, but my first hedge fund didn't succeed. And I had to go out of my own pocket to pay the investors back, which was... Uh, a lot of fun. Most hedge fund managers don't do that. When they, they lose their clients' money, they... I saw that you were part of the uh, Kramer Investments, or you're part of his hedge fund, before you like, got into college. Yeah. How? Well, it was his uh, last year, so I only overlapped with him for about nine months. And um, so, uh, you know, I but I did, you know, get in touch with him and I got an internship and I kind of parlayed that to a career on Wall Street. Um, you know, just just kept my ear to the ground and heard about uh, the opening and uh, begged and begged and begged for to work a few days a week. And then I begged for a full-time job. And, you know, I tried to impress them and make their lives easier. And, you know, it worked out. You know, cream is about the the health the helplessness of cash ruling everything around you. There's not a person at this table that cash doesn't rule everything around them because we all have to pay rent. We all have to pay bills. It sucks. So, as a child, I said, you know what? I don't want cash to rule everything around me, but it has to. And in, in some way, not in every way, but in some way. And so, to the extent that I have to play that game, I'm going to play it good. I'm going to play it great, and I'm going to win. And I'm still going to separate the things that cash doesn't rule, like relationship I have with my family has nothing to do with money. We don't care about money, you know. But the relationship I have with my bank and my bankers and what else does? And I have to play that game and 
but you know, I live in an apartment building in Manhattan that a lot of people move to post college. And they're like, they see me and they're like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, this is where I moved to post college and I haven't moved out because this is, this is where I live. Like, yeah, like, why would I live in Central Park or Columbus Circle, like, or the Upper East Side? I, I'm glad you're happy in your $20 million apartment that's like a box in the sky, but like, yeah, I don't trust, uh, I don't understand real estate prices. Oh, you want to know what? You're going to go down. I don't, I, I, I'm suspicious of them, I'll say that. Negative, uh, 0.5% or? Now, uh, another question. If I'm like, um, I'm like up like 35 percent on Pfizer. Do you think I should just unload right now? Listen, when it comes to stocks, it's not about uh, you know it's an old saying. You know, it's not about where you came from; it's where you're going. You know, if you think that that stock has more upside, hold on to it. If you think that stock doesn't have more upside or has downside, you don't. It doesn't matter if you're up, down, flat, up a huge amount, down a huge amount. Even if you bought Pfizer for $800 a share, and now it's 35, your purchase price should not impact the way you're approaching the current investment. The current investment is, you know, I don't know where is that, 35 now, something like that? 36 something. Yeah, so if you think it's going to 50, you hold on. If you think it's going to 20, you get out. It's as simple as that. And if it's somewhere in between- yeah, shouldn't, shouldn't you have like an alpha? Shouldn't you have a point where you you should take money off the table. Nah, you know, I, I think that's a, the wrong perspective because a lot of people, what they do is they'll they'll find the winner of a century, like the next Microsoft or Facebook, right? And they'll they'll buy it, they'll buy it at twenty, and they did all the work to find it, and then at forty they get out. And what they miss is the stock going to 60, 80, 100, 200, 400, 800, because you know they're blinded by their greed. Um, and I think you just have an out. Look, Pfizer's a big company. It's not going up. Um, so if I were you, I would sell it um, in general. That's, that's what I'm saying. Well, my question was more based on where it's at right now, market cap, and just overall the amount of growth that they can, I guess, achieve over the next yeah, few years. Little to none, <laughs> yeah. Um, little to none, at least, exactly. At least relative to expectations, especially. I mean, they can manage their company really well, but it's not going to... You know, it's not going to do the trick. I mean, I, I for one think that stocks are somewhat overvalued, and I would prefer cash. I usually do. I, I do hate people who listen to music while they work. I used to ban that in my office. I call you listening to music. I'd ask what if you wanted to get a job at my record label instead. And so once you make me millions of dollars, I'll let you uh, listen to music. But until then, do your job. Why would you add distractions? Focus on your job. Go work at Goldman Sachs or you can listen to Drake all day. Yeah, Goldman Sachs will let you do that. Go to SAC Capital. Steve Cohen will be like, oh, what you listening to, dog? Why don't you upload that to my SoundCloud? Oh, is that the new Drake? Let me get an earbud. Oh, is there is the treasury market still open? Hold on, I'm listening to this fire beat. I gotta catch up on my Rihanna instead of working. I can't focus on listening to... If I'm listening to music, of course you can. Yeah, I would fire them if they're if they're really sick of that at my job, then they would make me millions of dollars. Once they made me millions of dollars, they can listen to music, they can spill their coffee in my face. If they're making me money, I don't care. But until you've made me a lot of money. It's not smart to invest in someone who shouldn't go into finance, but you're into finance. So like how does that how does that work? Like why did you go into finance and why are you telling other people that they well, should I'm different from you. I'm the goat, and you're yeah. like the sheep. Gotcha. So, what do you think? What makes you different than a normal person? I was blessed, lucky, you know. Blessings on blessings on blessings. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. So, what would you say to the people who feel as though, like, have you ever heard of um, Timothy Sykes? Yes. Yeah. What do you think of the people like him who? advise other people that they should kind of get into the stuff that you do. I've said it a million times. Uh, investing is like um, wanting to be in the uh, in the UFC. And uh, if you're really good at it, it's a good idea. If you're not ready to fight brilliant jiu-jitsu in a octagon, don't do it. 
Makes sense. See, now I'm a 17 year old kid. What would you think if I was to say that if a person worked hard at it and then potentially got better at it, like started started young basically and potentially got better at it, that it would be a smart idea? Or do you think that it's just a lost cause altogether? I think if you love something, you should pursue it. Well, I appreciate your time. Okay. How, how, how did you get so um, successful? Where did you go right? Where did you go right? Uh, well, I, I, there's a long list of ways I went wrong. Um, so I've been very successful, and I thank God every day for that. But, you know, I'd say um, just perseverance is probably the number one thing. I mean, there's a lot of ups and downs in business and being uh, willing to sort of pick yourself up when you make a mistake and keep kind of keep – grinding and keep fighting for success. That's probably my hallmark. You know, a lot of people who know me know that I've faced some pretty big challenges um, with businesses. Well, I, I started a company called Retrofin. Um, I took it public. Called what? Retrofin. It's a, a biotech company. I took it public. I invented the first half dozen drugs for it and uh, licensed some drugs for it and then started buying medicines they're like FDA approved. What? I bought three different, uh, two different FDA approved, three different FDA approved drugs called Viola, Kenadol, and Vecamil, and then got a fourth one approved called Colbam, and then um, put one drug into clinical trials called Sparsentan. I invented a drug called REO24, invented a whole series of fusion proteins. Um, so, you know, that was my big accomplishment. Then at Turing Pharmaceuticals, I I built a successful large company pretty quickly with that. Um, so, you know, just a lot of success in pharma 